Good afternoon. Thank you for joining MSBA for today's webinar. Uh, we're talking about compliance and cybersecurity, uh, insurance demystified, and you've got a great speaker who's going to kind of walk you through um, all of that. Um, all lines are going to be muted throughout. We're expecting quite a few people to join us on the line. Uh, we are recording the session, so um, any questions you ask uh, will be in, in a publicly uh, available um, platform. So just to be aware of that, please. Um, as you all know, October is Cybersecurity Month, which is a great fit with the scary season of Halloween. Um, today's program is going to be great. Um, it may be scary at some points, but our guest speaker is here, and uh, I think he's going to demystify it and make it a little less scary. Um, our speaker, I'm happy to introduce, is uh, Raphael Matone. He's the founder and CEO of Detroit-based Judy Security, in, uh, um, which was founded in March 2019. His strategic thinking and effective leadership have been instrumental and paramount in his career as an IT sales and operations professional. Raphael is a profession, uh, passionate supporter of Detroit's tech and startup communities and has been an active supporter of NSBA for years now. So we're really thankful to have him as, as part of our team here. Um, hopefully some of you got to chat with him at uh, Washington presentation. He had a booth set up there and some really cool glasses and other, other fun stuff. So hopefully everybody got um, some of that good stuff. So um, with that, Raphael, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I, before I do that, I apologize. Um, I do wanna mention, we are gonna put, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will save some time at the end of the session for you to ask Raphael questions directly, and then you can use the uh, raise your hand function of the Zoom platform. Um, until then, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll keep an eye on those and answer wherever we can, uh, and then get to any other questions at the end. So with that, Raphael. Thanks, Molly. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see some familiar faces and new faces. So um, as Molly mentioned, I have uh, 25 years in cybersecurity, uh, being at some smaller companies that went global from McAfee, FireEye, and Duo uh, before um, starting Judy Security uh, five years ago. So what we've pulled together is some feedback that we heard in DC, which is why we're excited to talk about this topic a little further, as well as what we're hearing from our customers and partners as they begin their journey into uh, cybersecurity um, and uh, around um, cybersecurity insurance. Um, I will say that we've never seen this part of the industry growing this way. I think many customers and partners find it as a safety net as we would for um, home insurance is kind of what it's comparable to. Um, but these are just some of the learnings that we've learned. Um, and we definitely, as Molly mentioned, ask questions. I'm happy to have them coming in and answering them. And then we'll have some more questions at the end. So if we look at small and medium-sized businesses, which is what the acronym SMB stands for, um, many are being uh, hit by cyber uh, security attacks over the last couple of years, and no surprise, but they are surpassing enterprise. Um, the enterprise has had 20 years to build out their security framework uh, to hire big teams. Um, and so it's actually easier uh, to not breach the enterprise because it takes longer to breach them um, and there's a fast return by um, looking at small and medium-sized businesses uh, for different things that we'll talk about here in a moment. So the landscape of cybersecurity is very complex. <laughs> um, I think the, as security leaders over the last 20 years, we made it too complex and many have always gravitated towards the enterprise. Um, three and five SMBs have faced a cyber attack. Some know it, some don't. Um, at SMBs have been left behind by a lot of cybersecurity companies where the product is created for the enterprise and then it's too complex for small and medium-sized businesses to roll out. Um, and we feel obviously that small and medium-sized businesses deserve better um, because it is the largest opportunity to protect um, and get that right, not only cybersecurity insurance, but your solution. So what we're seeing across the industry is that many are breached. Um, the, the why, of, I'm not gonna go through each of these they're breached, is that, again, it's easier to steal the credentials, um, the data, and even though a lot of misconception what small and medium-sized businesses don't have revenue, they do. So think of it this way. Most small and medium-sized businesses work with federal government, like we saw in DC, work with enterprise organizations as outside services, work with hospitals, work with education. The data you're sharing is very valuable. 
so valuable that being able to leverage you as a small business to get into them is one of the fastest way of creating a uh, breach through phishing. So this is what we're seeing now um, across many small and medium-sized businesses is where maybe a team member clicks on something and think they're logging into a Chase Bank account, but it's a phishing landing page and they steal the credentials. They may not take the money out of your bank account, but they see a wire transfer from an enterprise company. That's a way of backdooring into that organization. Um, it could be social engineering. So we are seeing with the AI that our voice, our image can all be created based on videos that are online through social media or as leaders of all of you publicly speaking. So even there, as we saw with the large casino, someone called in and sounded like an employee. And so they reset their credential passwords and allowing for that billion dollar casino to be breached a couple of months ago. So there's many different ways that we're seeing small and medium sized businesses are either being attacked or leverage to be attacked. And if fun fundamentally, the number one reason is there's a financial gain, either through the small and medium sized business or going uh, upwards into those larger organizations. And cybersecurity it can halt a business. It halts enterprise. We've all seen that. It can be what much worse for small and medium sized businesses. And as Molly said, this isn't about doom and gloom. It's just recognizing that many small and medium sized businesses are starting their journey. This is where the enterprise was 20 years ago, where this terminology, this technology and the belief that they would be breached was in its infancy. But when a smaller medium sized business is breached, we see that it can take 12 weeks to recover. We see that it can be very costly. And so, you know, anywhere from $826 to we've seen all the way up to 700,000, depending on what you do in your business and how it not only impacts your team, but also your customers who may not be able to do business with you if there's a potential breach. Whoops. And then lastly, and then we'll get into the cybersecurity insurance. Many of the solutions out there are not tailored for small and medium sized businesses. We have thought leaders across the industry are now being honest about this. Um, it takes very large teams to maintain them. Many are cost prohibitive. They require dedicated staff. They only solve one problem. Um, and they're very complex, especially when you're working remotely or trying to meet uh, compliance frameworks like many of you and us that were at the NSBA event wanting to work with the federal government. The federal government is now requiring that you be CMMC, NIST, SIS. We're hearing all these acronyms acronyms on frameworks for you to just even be able to apply for an RFP. And many are now suggesting also that you do need to have cybersecurity insurance. And so that is the segue of where we're going as an industry. Only 17% of businesses uh, that are small have cybersecurity insurance to protect their investment. Um, that's okay, because many I think the, even the insurance industry has been learning over the last three years. Three years ago, you could check a box and get a policy suggesting that you had cybersecurity tool sets. Now they've had to write some big checks. So even their process has been more formalized and we're seeing a standard on how they're doing it. Similar to when you buy your home um, or renter insurance, it's almost the same process. So, Oops. So why is cybersecurity insurance a potential way of you protecting your business? It's not solely the only. It covers your business's liability. So if you were to have a data breach and you lost your customer information or that customer information led to a potential another breach, many cybersecurity insurance policies now can protect you um, from legal fees, from the recovery of the data, um, recovering identity. So if you as the business owner, your social security number is now being used in other areas, uh, damages to your network or your computers, because obviously an attack can damage even down to the individual system layer um, and any settlement costs. Because if there is a breach triggered by one organization into another organization, you can be liable for those costs. So cybersecurity insurance at its highest level have these different types of components within the policy. And it's really 
up to you as the business owner to understand what you're comfortable with, what you need to protect your business, and make sure that when you're working with the underwriter, like you would with a home insurance policy, you're giving them those details so that they can give you the different options to create that policy and tell you the costs. Because not everything is included. It's just like a home policy. I did my home policy about a month ago. It was like, is your roof new or old? Do you have a <laughs> updated furnace? You know, Are you willing to go without flood insurance? Those are the questions you're going to be asked in cybersecurity insurance more around, do you, if you were breached, do you have to replace all of your hardware? If you were breached, how, much, how sensitive is your data, right? So that's how you need to start thinking in your journey on cybersecurity insurance. So who needs cybersecurity insurance? Again, this is as it could be a benefit, not an absolute, because nothing is absolute in the world. But we see many businesses that we work with, accountants, consultants, law firms, contractors, auto dealerships, um, IT services, marketing companies, restaurants, real estate, retails, anyone that's collecting data or has a relationship or service that they're offering to other organization in high amounts usually need cybersecurity insurance. And if you're working with the federal government, which I know many in this group, that is one compart uh, component of your revenue, you probably should look at cybersecurity insurance to protect you and them. <clears throat> Maybe you're not seeing your business on here. These are just the top ones that we're seeing right now. It's not suggesting that you shouldn't. Um, again, but these are the ones that are heavily dependent on regulatory items. So if you, as a business owner here, PCI, which usually means you're collecting credit card information, like accountants, law firms, consultants, or any of the regulatory items like car dealerships where you're gathering social security numbers. Um, when we buy a car, they now have regulatory items that ha they have to meet. Um, IT services or marketing companies, you're gathering data, you're building websites that have to be HIPAA compliant because they're touching medical data. There's so many different ways, but fundamentally, it's the different frameworks that start to lead into also as another component of whether you need cyber insurance. And then maintaining cybersecurity insurance is an operational um item after an attack. So if you do get breached, yes, the cybersecurity insurance is there to protect you, but you can see that the underwriter or the company that owns your policy might become a little bit more firm on how you need to proceed in your cybersecurity journey with additional tool sets, with additional people. So it's not as if you get the cybersecurity insurance and you're done. It is a journey and one that you have to be cautious on um, and if there is a breach, it could mean that they may not renew you or that they require you to deploy more software or services that go back into the cybersecurity um, portfolio. So how do you really assess and select the right cybersecurity insurance policy? The first thing I would say is it's a new arena. Try to go with a reputable company. Ask business partners that you've worked with, who they have um, already worked with, because what you don't want to do is get a cybersecurity insurance policy and then find out when you need it that you didn't have the right things or that the organization is not a reputable organization. It is emerging, so be cautious. And in any cybersecurity component, if the company doesn't sound right or look right, then you may not want to apply, right? Again, another way to fish and get your information and breach your company. So, but start to write down these five things. So what is your risk? And what we mean by that is if you were breached tomorrow, someone put a ransomware on your PC as the owner of your business or the VP of finance in your organization, and it locked everything down and they held you ransom for days or weeks, what would that do to your business? You all know what that is but you really need to have that clear picture of assessing what your cyber risk is from that lens, as well as what tool sets do you have today? If you say nothing, they're not going to probably take you on 
as a policyholder or your premium and your monthly amounts are going to be so big, you may not be able to proceed. So this is the first thing you need to do, really understand. Um, and there are many companies out there that can help you with this if you feel like you don't know the right answer. Um, because again, we know many are starting their journey. That risk will weigh, be the weight against your premium costs. So if you hear terminologies from the underwriter of multi-factor, you need a password manager. You need to be able to scan what's going on with your PCs, your network, or even servers. Um, you need the ability to block and tackle. Those are general terms, but they get much more in the weeds on what they're expecting out of you. Um, most cybersecurity insurance policies are now about 20 to 30 pages that you have to fill out. Um, and the days of suggesting that as an example, oh yeah, I have a password manager, they'll ask you to have the receipt from the provider attached to the premium now. That is some of the bigger changes that they're implementing versus, oh, I just check a box like I told you on my home insurance. They're not doing that anymore. In cybersecurity insurance, they're starting to get a little bit more restrictive and even show the proof. Um, it's okay to shop for policies. So shop for a couple of policies. You're filling out a form. You now have one done. You can fill out two more, see who has the lowest premium that meets what you're looking for. Um, and there are many different flavors out there. So there's nothing wrong with shopping uh, for different, um, for different uh, policies. Um, read the reviews on the insurance companies. So again, as in anything that we're buying, what are others seeing with that insurance company? Um, how prepared are they to help you if there is a breach, right? Again, you get the lower premium, but at the time of your breach, you find that other customers, it's taking three to six months to get the money. That may not help you, right? So understand what is the process after you've been breached and how long does it take to, for them to help you, right, within the policy? And then it, seek expert feedback. Um, again, any company that you work with, whether it be maybe MSPs that do your IT or security, uh, software companies, or even us, can help you determine if this is the right need for your business. And Molly, I'm just going to check. I'm assuming there's no questions yet, but you'll stop me if you see any, because <laughs> I, I can't see it on my screen. Yep. Nope. Nothing yet. All right. Perfect. Whoops. So, you know, you may say, well, what will they pay for? Some policies will pay for a ransom payment. We've all seen that where they lock down your whole company from a technology perspective and they hold you ransom. And if you feel like what you are delivering as a company is that valuable, then you might go with a higher premium where they pay ransom amounts of a million dollars or $2 million, right? We've seen that in the press. Um, would there be a potential for customer or employee lawsuits? Again, you're breached and you triggered a breach for another company or all of the employee data was taken and you're potentially held for a lawsuit because now their credit cards are being impacted, their social security number. So again, what is your, what is it that you want to pay? Um, loss of income is another item based on days, weeks, or months, depending how far this goes to reset your company and put you back on the path of not being under that breach or attack. Uh, regulatory fines. So if you do have compliance frameworks that you're mapping to, I'll say them again, CMMC, PCI, HIPAA, NIST, are there things that could be associated to that compliance framework that you have that could lead to regulatory fines as well for having a breach? Um, public relation costs, so is your brand damaged now and it's gonna take three to six months to rebuild your brand? Um, intentional acts, so an employee maliciously does something within your company that opens up this door, highly unlikely, but in some scenarios could happen. Um, do you have knowledge of prior uh, breaches within your company? You would need to disclose that and that could lead to um, payout of something that maps back to that exact incident. So think of it this way. Um, I click on something 
and it causes my real estate broker to be breached. The real estate broker never mentioned it to anyone, but then went and got cybersecurity insurance. I buy another house again and I create that breach. I should have disclosed it in my cybersecurity insurance if that is a prior act that could have happened again, because they will look for that pattern if you have multiple uh, breaches that lead to payout with insurance companies. Do you have subsidiary companies that you need to be worried about, um, either directly or indirectly? Uh, criminal proceedings. So is there anything that you do that if there's a breach, it could lead to you know criminal proceedings? There's policies that will cover that. And then business interruption at a general level or very microscopic, like we talk about up above. Those are the things you have to have an understanding on before you fill out that form. And I know it seems like a lot, but as business owners, it really shouldn't. You know where your touch points are. So just make sure you're asking the insurance company to include them or exclude them um, when you're filling out the form or on the phone with the auditor. Um, let me talk about that. So then you get into, okay, well, now I've started to understand what is cybersecurity insurance and how it might map to compliance. You still have to have some sort of security tool sets. So what is, you know, this goes beyond the compliance of what you're mapped to or insurance. So would you pass an audit is the question you need to ask yourself. If you know the answer is no, as in, well, we share passwords all over the company. Okay, Th then you should probably resolve that as soon as you can before you go into the ask of a policy with an insurance company. Um, you know, they might ask you for reports. They might ask you for, depending on how big of a liability you could be, they do have the right to ask you for this information. Um, and that's where you need to make sure your security posture, which is what it's called, is up to par with what your business does. And then, you know, achieve compliance with auditors quickly. A lot of times the auditors will view cybersecurity insurance as a good thing because they've become so restrictive now on what you need to deploy. So if you do go through an audit with compliance, that would be another thing that could check the box quickly on your cybersecurity tool set. And then a lot of customers are now starting to ask for it. So if you win a multi-million dollar deal, they might not only ask you about your compliance framework and security posture, they might say, do you have cybersecurity insurance? And if it's from a reputable company and approved, then that is another checkbox as you're starting to work with your, uh, customers um, and win business. Looks like there might be some questions. I'm Molly, do you want me to... I don't know if I can click on it. Yeah, any. yeah, we do have um, one question. So let me just read it in the chat. Um, Melanie asks, are there particular standards or questions that most or all insurance companies look for or ask, uh, like a standard checklist or questionnaire? Usually the checklist will include different point products that you must have. We see, um, I, I would say, let me let me say it this way. Yes, there's standards. There seems to be a standard on questions around your business. So those are the same questions you would see in any form. You know, what, what do you do? What's your revenue? How many employees? Um, who are your biggest customers? Those are the things that we see at the beginning. It's when you get to the middle around specifically the cybersecurity tool sets that it can vary based on the amounts you're asking for for them to cover. So lower policies usually only show multi-factor and a password manager as being the required point products in the policy. Usually those are well under $100 million in policy. You start to go over that million dollar threshold or get closer to it, a lot of the policies are now saying, do you have endpoint protection? Endpoint protection is the third one that starts to bubble up. So now you have to have multi-factor, password manager, endpoint protection. If you're not familiar with it, endpoint protection is going to be scanning your computer for any viruses, ransomware, MITRE attacks, and that you can produce a report um, to ensure that those devices are not breached. Um, as you go up in dollars, 
or complexity within your business. So let's say you have a big network or you have servers that are housing code or data sharing with other organizations. That's where they might say, well, do you have someone that's monitoring those like a SOC team, which can happen through like your MSP or, or MSSP. And they're looking at the logs. And if there's a breach, you're able, they're able to block and remediate it for you. Um, so it really goes down into the point products, Molly, depending on how big of a policy you're needing to cover your business. Thanks for that, Raphael. Um, Derwin has a question. Is it normal behavior to be skeptical or skeptical or turned off by businesses that randomly call me to sign up for their security system? I find it to come across like a threat. Yeah, you should be skeptical about anyone that calls you, honestly. I would look up the company name. So when I get a call, even if it's Chase <laughs> or Amazon, I type it into the browser, look up the domain, and see if they're a reputable company. I also then start to click through and see if they're who their customers are, right? Do they have a LinkedIn page? Has the LinkedIn page just been spun up in the last couple months? Or has it been sitting there for a year? There's different red flags. Right. So that's where I start to say, look for companies that have traditional insurance. And are they now offering cybersecurity insurance? Is your best path forward at least to get one of the quotes to compare to? And then, yeah, there's some emerging ones that are actually pretty cool. And they do have money in the bank and they can cover you, but it's a different type of risk, right? If they're emerging, you're taking that on under the risk. But yes, long wave answer. Anyone calls you, we train everyone in cybersecurity and you don't know who it is, jot down the company name, look it up online. And if you see a phone number that's different than the one that they left you, call the number online and ask for that person through the operator. If they say they're not there, it was probably a phishing attempt. As an example, which I know it's a huge company. Amazon, I get phishing attempts all the time that supposedly they need that my tracking number has changed and I just need to click on this link or that someone's called calling and wants to talk to me. That's kind of rare, but I always check the phone number. Nope, it's not Amazon's phone number. So it was probably a phishing attempt, right? So the same thing is happening with cybersecurity insurance and AI and cybersecurity across the industry. So yes, you should always have that skeptical lens and just look it up online. Um, and then ask colleagues, like I said at the beginning, if you hear of a company name and they sound reputable, there's nothing wrong with you asking for references. So who are they working with that they're willing to give you as a reference would be my next step. So you found that they are a valid company. They seem like they're emerging. Ask for references like we would all ask in any other part of the industry. And they're not willing to give that to you. That's a problem. Thanks, Raphael. Um, just a reminder to everybody on the line, um, please feel free to put your questions into the group chat. Um, you can also raise your hand using the Zoom function. Uh, you know, selfishly, I have kind of a question about this, Raphael, and that's, uh, it kind of com comes from a policy perspective. So how does this vary if you're in multiple states uh, that have different data privacy protection rules? Is there is there anything people need to be aware of with that? Yeah, some of the policies are by state. Some are national. So again, it goes back to where, how are you doing business? If you're doing business with the federal government and you have a healthy contract or um, are working with contractors that work with the federal government, I would lean more towards a bigger name brand um, on your insurance policy that can handle a national level. If you're working locally within state, yes, your policy and you're, you're not leaving your state, you don't share data outside of your state, you're very local, you can get a local policy and yes, the premium will probably be lower. So there are variances on state and national level. And if you go global, that's a whole nother can of, or another opportunity, I should say, <laughs> to ensure that you're getting the right policy and your auditor would ask you that. Well, wait a minute. I see you have an office in the UK. What does that mean? Or are you transacting with other businesses globally because you're SaaS or consulting services? Yes, you're going to want a global insurance policy if that's what you need to protect your business. Good question. Okay. Right. Um, are there any other questions right now? 
I'm not seeing anything. Raphael, anything else you want to touch touch upon? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, we're always here to also promote ourselves, like Molly said. So if you do need help, we have services. We have the software. Our software is called Judy. She does map to all of the um, insurance programs as well as compliance programs that are out there. We have a lot of NSBA members now that have um, partnered with us. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. She's designed only for small and medium-sized businesses. Her AI removes the burden of having to hire a security team and we price it at a cost that you can afford. So I'll stop there and see what other questions you have. If you want to open the lines, Molly, I'm very much about being interactive, uh, not death by PowerPoint. So. Sure, everybody, you should be able to unmute your line. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute it now, or you can raise your hand. I can unmute you. Have you seen any situations where this was a perk in government contracting, kind of like having a DCA auditable software or, you know, a system, it's it's an advantage. You're more it likely is. to get a contract because of it. Would, would this have a similar perk bonus benefit? Yeah, we're starting to see on RFP submissions, they ask that question. And if you can attach an insur cybersecurity insurance policy, it is a perk. Because again, with the right insurance policies or companies that they're coming from, again, this is where you need to assess your personal business. So if I see a larger insurance company being submitted in an RFP, right? Yes, we see customers uh, move forward in the RFP process because it's a reputable company. They can see in the policy, it's very restrictive, right? You've had to already go through that cybersecurity um, audit and that you've associated the right products or solutions. Um, that is a way for you to move forward in the RFP process. I did get another question, Raphael, from Melanie. Uh, some states and counties are requiring uh, very high coverage limits, um, potentially pricing out SMBs. Any chance of those premiums coming down? We are seeing that they're starting to come down. We're seeing some of the bigger players start to really get in um, and wanting to partner and win the business of small and medium-sized uh, companies. I think this is where... If the premium is too high, you need to ask the question, maybe you're missing a piece of the solutions that's causing your premium to go high, or is it really because your business has sensitive data? And, you know, so there's a lot of different variables even there um, where you can have someone look at it for you and determine if um, maybe they're viewing you the wrong way as a customer or you're just meet, missing some of the components that could lower your premium. Right. Any other questions or comments, feel free to unmute and, and state your question or you can put it in the chat. Finding this helpful? I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm open to feedback. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no hurt feelings here. Like I said, it's a journey for all of us. We're just trying to... Uh, make sure we share the information that we're seeing with other small and medium-sized businesses, so. And I, I may have frightened folks from uh, asking questions by saying that we're recording it and we're gonna be making it public. So um, if that's the case, I do apologize. Feel free to send, um, oh, you know what, I just, we did get another question. Um, what are some of the best prices slash ranges you're seeing in the market for a $5 million range? $5 million range, um, we're usually seeing anywhere from uh, annually, um, God, I've seen everywhere. Again, it, it's it's hard to just use a dollar range, so I'm going to be careful here. Um, we've seen anywhere from five thousand dollars up to twenty thousand dollars, but again, it depends on what you're asking them to pay in that a la carte component, right? Um, that could trigger the actual amount you're paying up front on a monthly or annual basis. Okay. As an example of that, just to clear, like you might say, well, if we are breached, I want you to pay the lawsuits. Okay, well, how much up to what amount? 200000 500000 all legal fees, um, recovering all customer data for up to 500000 right? There's, it's that whole piece of the puzzle of what you're adding into that policy um, to be able to uh, get the best policy, but also a premium that you can afford per month. And if you have, I'm not going to do it on this call, but if you have questions on 
potential insurance companies that you might want to work with, I'm always, we're always happy to help um, and guide you to, uh, we have about 20 of them that our customers are leveraging and we've vetted. So we'd be happy to introduce you uh, to them offline. Just reach out to Molly and we can um, get you that information. Thanks, Raphael. Uh, another quick question. Are there any policies which reduce premiums if you give access to your internal, internal security data? No. Um, you mean as in the scans? I, I guess that's a loaded question I shouldn't have answered <laughs> or a question yes, I should have qualified. So you're talking about like if you do have a SOC team and you're able to show the scans or the vulnerabilities that you're protecting from? Yes. Yep. Yes. It, that is one of the things that an auditor would ask for and it could lower your premium. You would just have to flag how often your team is doing it. Um, and what cadence you're comfortable giving it to them. Okay. I think Derwin had a question. Uh, you're on mute. I don't we can't, we know can't hear Derwin if you're trying to ask a question. I don't know if you have to unmute him or he does. No, he should be unmuted. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I don't want to to take longer if there, if there aren't questions, but I do want to mention if you're... Um, if you do have questions that you're thinking about the rest of the day, feel free to shoot them to me, mday at nsba.biz. Uh, I'm happy to forward those along to Raphael. Um, so with that, Raphael, any final comments and we can wrap it up? Uh, if you have any questions or uh, want help with the <laughs> insurance policy or solution, you're more than welcome to email Molly or me. Uh, my contact info is uh, available as well and we're happy to help. Derwin, were you able to unmute? I didn't know if it came through. Nope. All right. Well, I'll work with Molly offline and get your email address and I can answer your question offline then. But I appreciate all of you being here. Um, we love working with small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, Molly and Ian, thank you so much for pulling this together. Hopefully it was uh, um, what everyone was looking for. And um, again, aware it's uh, Cybersecurity uh, Awareness Month, but really that's every day. So thank you for having us. This is Thanks, awesome. Raphael. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye.